Now let's talk about what we actually see in humans and see if that aligns with our assumptions about what race is. When we're trying to evaluate different hypotheses, it really helps to think about several different options and come up with what we expect the data to look like before we actually look at the data. This helps us have an unbiased view of what we expect to see, and then we can compare it with what we actually see. This example right here is a typologist view. A typologist, or essentialism, thinks that there are distinct types and each group is different. So in this graph, this visualizes three different populations, A, B, and C. And in this Venn diagram, there's only a tiny bit of overlap. This is visualizing amount of genetic overlap. We would expect a little bit of overlap between different populations, especially if we're talking about subspecies. Even when we're looking at biological species, there are occasional interbreeding between different species. So a little bit of overlap would be expected. Here is a populationist view. This is what maybe a population geneticist would expect to see between different subspecies. Um, so now we're seeing more overlap, but we're still seeing pretty uh, distinct population clusters here. Um, again, we are visualizing this in uh, genetic variation. Um, you could think of it as which alleles are present in which population. So in the area that is only A, that would be alleles that we only find present in population A. In the 70s, Lewinton found this. So this was the first data that we have about genetic uh, variants and how they uh, appear in different human populations. As you can see, most genetic variation is shared amongst all human populations. So already, we are not fitting with either the assumptions from the typologist or the population geneticist view. Now, we've got, done this a little bit more, and we're actually finding something more like this. Now we're finding even more overlap. Almost all genetic variation that we find is actually present in all human populations. And the amount of genetic variation that is, you know, these tiny little slivers that are present only in one population, it's not very much. We're also finding one population has more genetic variation than the others, visualized here in red as population C. Do you know who that is? You guessed Africans. You are right. We're finding more genetic variation in Africans than we are in any other population. We're also finding that individual Africans are just as different from each other than we are to, uh, than a non-African is to them, or than even a French person is to a British person. Um, here we can put all of this on one page just so we can see it all together. If you viewed race as an essential category that there are distinct different types, you would expect not to see much overlap. But what we're actually seeing is almost all genetic variation in humans is overlapping, and there's just a tiny little amount that is unique to different populations. It's also interesting to compare the amount of genetic variation in modern humans to other um, species, especially our close relatives, chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutans. This shows genetic distance. So the length of each line indicates how different um, genomes are from each other. So way off in the corner, that's orangutans. We expect that. We're not as closely related to them as we are to gorillas or chimpanzees. And you can see we're a little bit closer to chimpanzees than we are to gorillas. One thing to notice here is that um, different groups have different numbers of samples. So eastern gorilla has seven underneath it. That means we have seven samples for the eastern gorilla. Western gorilla, we have 15. And you can see the genetic variation there is actually pretty spread out. Um, and you can even look at chimpanzees. We have a couple different groups here, Eastern chimpanzees, Central chimpanzees, Nigerian chimpanzees, and Western chimpanzees, and also bonobos. We have several pretty distinct clusters that are fairly large. Now, if you look at modern humans, it's all kind of one gigantic mess. We have more samples than the others. We have 811, but they're all super close to each other and overlapping. What do you think this means? 
This means that all humans are very closely related to each other, and we actually have less genetic variation in humans than we see in chimpanzees, even though they're endangered. Remember, that's our fault. Uh, we can also visualize this information in a phylogenetic tree. Here, we are looking at mitochondrial haplotypes. This is the mitochondrial genome. Um, the first person to name these used the letters of the alphabet, so we've continued that tradition. Um, but let's look at where the African lineages are. Where are all these? Um, the L lineages um, and some of the M lineages, and they all go to the very base of the tree. But those lineages aren't actually closely related to each other because they have very deep population splits. So we can't actually group them all together. That leaves us with a paraphyletic tree, if you remember from phylogenetics. Here's a slightly different way to um, visualize. This one's nice because it has names rather than letters, which might um, help people understand a little bit. Now we can clearly see all of the non-African lineages are nesting within the African lineages. So we just had one African lineage that gave rise to all non-Africans. So while all non-Africans are relatively closely related to each other, that is uh, not the case when we're uh, comparing them to Africans, which have these very uh, deep population splits. It can also be helpful to overlay this over geography because this helps you see um, some of the historical migrations. Of course, it was a little bit more complicated than this, but this can help us get a broad understanding of how we migrated throughout the world. Because we've been in Africa for longer, all of the lineages here are older, but that means they're actually not that closely related to each other. Another thing we see when looking at human biological variation is something called a cline. This just means a continuous gradation over a geographical area. We see these all over in biology and in all different species. Here's a simple example. So here we see the frequency of yellow-brown hair in um, Australian Aboriginals, it has really high incidence in one spot, but the farther you get away from that spot, it actually decreases in frequency. And we see this all over. Another way to visualize um, genetic diversity is through color, um, like we talked about in our population genetics lecture. So here we're seeing more different lineages, more different colors in Africa, but the farther away you get from Africa, you're finding fewer and fewer. This is something called a serial founder effect. This is where we have a founder effect, but it happened again and again and again and again. This is where a strong understanding of the forces of evolution, especially genetic drift, will come in handy. What happened is we started in Africa. We had a lot of genetic variation. We had one founder event where some people moved to the Middle East. We lost a little bit of genetic variation. Some people moved to Europe. They lost a little bit more. Some people went to Asia. They lost a little bit more. And each step they made along the way, we lost a little bit of genetic variation. So we had founder events happening in a series with consistent reduction in genetic variation. We know this because of data like this. So there's a lot of graphs on this slide. Let's take a look. So let's look at our top graph. We are graphing pairwise distance between populations, or geographic distance in kilometers, versus genetic distance. And we're noticing a negative relationship, where this means the closer two populations are in space, the more ge genetically related they are. But you would expect that. So all this says is populations that are close to each other have gene flow. And the farther away populations are, they don't really have gene flow. The bottom graph is very different. Now we're graphing distance from East Africa in kilometers versus genetic diversity. So how many different um, gene variants do we find in this population? And now we have this negative relationship. Um, so the farther away you get from East Africa, the less genetic diversity you have. And this is our data to prove the serial founder event. Um, we use distance from East Africa in walking distance because we're trying to um, include the distance that people actually had to travel because, you know, we can't fly and sometimes there's geographic obstacles in the way. 
there have uh, been many different projects trying to get an idea of the diversity of the human genome. Um, the Human Genome Diversity Project was one of the earlier ones. And for how early it was, they actually did a pretty good job at getting um, many different populations represented. Um, they did this k-means analysis, which isn't a particularly good tool, but more interesting is their phylogenetic tree. I like how they colored it with different geographic regions. So you can see that different geographic regions do tend to be more closely related to each other. But in the case of Africans, you can see they're all at the base of the tree. So they're not actually more closely related to each other um, than they are to the rest of the, um, than they are to non-Africans. But all non-Africans have this recent common origin with that initial dispersal out of Africa. If you read the Nina Jablonski's paper on skin color variation, you would know that human skin color is simply an adaptation against UV radiation. If you're in an area of the world that has more intense UV radiation, you're going to have darker skin. And if you're in an area of the world without much UV radiation, you will have lighter skin. Um, I highly suggest you reread that paper if you haven't already, because that will give you a good um, example of how to view human adaptation um, with a couple selection pressures. Um, so to recap, with human variation, we see definite geographical patterning, but we can't subdivide it into discrete groups. We see these clines. There's no obvious lines we can draw anywhere. We find a high amount of variation within each group, but between these groups, there isn't much variation. So none of this really matches up with any classic ideas on race. And remember, ideas on race are only a couple hundred years old, so they aren't actually that old anyway. Better things to talk about are ancestry. Because yeah, these physical characteristics, which are used in modern times to denote racial groups, we do get most of them from our family. We do inherit our, inherit our phenotype. So ancestry is a way to recognize your lineage of descent. Let's visualize that. So here we have four generations, and we're looking at chromosomes. So we can start with the great uh, grandfather in blue. He marries um, the woman with tan a tan genome, and then their child has one blue chromosome and one tan chromosome. But as the farther you go down, you can see that we are a mixture of these ancestors. It can get confusing because some people like to talk about racial diseases, meaning sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, Tay-Sachs disease. Sickle cell anemia tends to be more frequent in Africans, cystic fibrosis in Europeans, and Tay-Sachs in Jews. Um, however, this is a population level statistic. It doesn't apply to the individual. Um, but let's talk a little bit about what's going on with some of these. Sickle cell anemia is a condition where your red blood cells actually collapse in upon themselves and form this sickle cell shape. Uh, we have a very good understanding of the molecular mechanisms underneath this. It is a point mutation at one single spot. Uh, we also call this a missense mutation because it codes for a different protein. We replace um, glutamate with valine. And valine has a polar charge. Because this is now a charge protein, it causes the different hemoglobin molecules to stick together. And that's what causes the red blood cell to collapse in upon itself because the different um, hemoglobin molecules are actually attracting each other. So it can't maintain that kind of puffy circular shape. Where do we find this? Well, we find it overlapping with malaria. Um, sickle cell anemia does seem to be an adaptation to protect against malaria at least a little bit. If we look at the life cycle of malaria, um, it enters us through a mosquito bite. Um, it first goes to our liver, but then it goes to our red blood cells to do asexual reproduction. And if we have uh, sickling cells, um, those red blood cells have a shorter lifespan, and it isn't as easy for the malaria parasite to utilize our red blood cells to reproduce. So we can essentially stop its life cycle there. So in this way, malaria, um, sickle cell anemia has been a really helpful tool to protect against malaria. So it's really about um, families that have ancestry to that specific region of the world. Malaria exists in many more places than just sub-Saharan Africa, but sickle cell anemia was the genetic uh, option that arose in that specific geographic region.
talk a little bit about cystic fibrosis. Um, so there are many channels in our cell membrane. Things need to get in and out of our cells. And in cystic fibrosis, some of them just don't work particularly well. So we get a buildup of mucus on the outside of our cells because we can't deal with it as well. Um, again, this is just in one gene on chromosome seven, the CFTR gene. And because of this buildup of mucus, it gets in our lungs, it gets in our pancreas. Um, and the most common symptom is just chronic coughing that never goes away. Um, we do notice that it does tend to be a little bit more prevalent in Eastern Europe or Europe in general. So some people like to propose that it was an adaptation or helped people survive the bubonic plague, um, but that is partial historic speculation that has been a little bit hard to prove. Um, some of what could be going on with these different racial diseases is they happen to be more common in certain populations, which align a little bit with common ideas of race, um, but just because they happen to align does not support the idea of distinct racism. It is important to also address ideas of racism itself. Racism is systemic discrimination based on perceived racial categories. So here, yeah, race is very real in a social context that has a lot of real social consequences, but it isn't backed up by the biological evidence. And it is always the group in power against suppressed minorities. Reverse racism, reso, reverse racism isn't a thing. Sure, we can have discrimination towards others, but that is simply called bigotry. So how is human bi biological variation pattern? Does it match assumptions about race? 